Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with the Q&A. So there's actually, there's a couple of questions um, for me, and I guess in terms of how we're going to run this session, we're basically going to just move chronologically through the questions as they uh, appeared uh, in the talks in the agenda. Um, but with the exception that there are some speakers who are unable to join us, and for those uh, speakers, if we have been able to obtain an answer to the question, I'll go ahead and read the question and answer it on their behalf. But otherwise, um, we'll just have to direct those questions to them for an offline discussion for those who are interested. So uh, first couple of questions for me from the introduction from the D3R team. There was a question about whether the source code in the GitHub repository accounts for symmetry aware RMSD computations. And our answer is yes. We use the maximum common substructure search to get all possible atom mappings and then retain and report the lowest RMSDs to count for all possible symmetry situations. And people can check that out as they want to. There was another question about um, someone had noticed that many of the, uh, the highlighted groups in our, I guess, selection of speakers turned out to be from industry and, and from Europe. And the question was whether this reflected the participation, the success of the groups, or was uh, something on D3R's part on our selection to emphasize this type of research in industry versus academia and globally. And the answer to that is um, I think we've had actually pretty good participation from all sectors in many geographic areas, which is terrific to see. Um, in terms of our selection, we do try to, uh, well, we're driven, of course, by the, by the performance of the different groups, but then as a subcategory, we do try to get a good spread of representation from academic and industrial groups um, so that we, we, ha we have allowed for that. But in t we don't really make any uh, considerations truly for geographic uh, considerations, so uh, that just turned out to be, in some sense, luck of the draw. Okay, and then the first question for someone other than myself <laughs> is a question for Dima at Stony Brook. I just sent an unmute request too. Thanks, Dima. So the question mm -hmm. is that in view of the experimental observation of important water contacts, why include crystallographic water in a second step rather than just directly from the beginning? Um, okay, no, that, yeah, that was a little bit of that we were, uh, uh, yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. And in fact, yeah, we, we redid now like with the water, I mean like, and then essentially yeah, we will arrive to the same results. It just, yeah, I mean like, it just since we were doing like like the codes on the fly, right? It 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 turned out to be easier for us doing this, right? But yeah, the question was absolutely meaningful, right? I mean, like making it this water directly would make yeah would make much more sense. We just were doing it in a relative hurry, so like yeah. So we, and we just reported the protocol as it was kind of like it was done at that moment, right? Perhaps it was essentially the realization of that we should use the water scheme a little bit later, and since we already had the runs we could actually minimize it was much easier and much faster for us to do this way, so. Okay, thank you very much. There was a question also to Pat Walters, uh, who did the, who's at Relay Therapeutics, he did, he discussed the Grand Challenge 2 overview of all results. Pat's actually unavailable to join us, but we were able to shoot him this question and he replied, and also we could have answered for him, but the question was, um, are all free energy submissions compared to each other, even though a number were only partial submissions, meaning that there were some folks who, um, some participants who submitted less than the full set of uh, compounds? And actually the answer to that is that we only, um, the results presented by Pat were only for the full submissions. Okay, and our next set of questions, there's a number of questions for Yuan Hu from Merck. So I just sent him an unmute request. There you go. Hi, Yuan. Hi, Yomi. So the first question, um, and these are in no particular order, your, your set of questions. There's about five. So your first mm -hmm. question is, um, uh, can you tell us more about the MD procedures as applied to ligand protein refinement? 
For example, how many replicates did you run? How long did you run? How are you selecting the final pose for comparison? Have you tested force field dependence, et cetera? Yeah, so for the MD procedure, we use uh, 20 replicates. And for each replicate, we do 3.5 millisecond equilibration and 1.5 millisecond uh, production. So this procedure we trained by uh, our internal data set and also some public data set. And this is the uh, number we select uh, to generate the minimum, uh, the minimum number required to generate the reproducible result. Um, and also we didn't do, uh, we didn't test other force fields. So the current force field we use is a, uh, uh, is the amber force field. So, uh, but it will be interesting to look, uh, to investigate the different force field dependence in the future. Do you know which amber force field you're using? Are you using 99 SB or something like that, or some variant of that? No, we use uh, FF12 uh, SB and also we use GAF for the ligand parameterization. I know there is a GAF2, so that it's also in interesting to look at the, in the future for the, how the GAF2 uh, performance for this prediction. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Um, the next question is, when you use the MD again for pose refinement, how did you handle positioning of the water molecules? Uh, so for water, water molecule, we know it's important, and, but in this prediction, we take the pose from ensemble docking, and in the ensemble docking, we didn't consider all, uh, the water, so we just uh, remove all the water we found in the PDB file and ge generate those water by using the amber uh, tailleaf tool. But in the following study, uh, we also uh, have some people looking at uh, the water, the importance of the water by using a uh, different tool. So uh, you will see something in the following up um, study, I think. Thanks. Thank you. No, that's great. Uh, can you talk a little bit more, tell us more about what you are actually using for the workflows themselves? For example, are you using just a series of scripts? Are you using Pipeline Pilot, NIME, Kepler? Yes, yeah, so for the workflow, uh, I use a Pipeline Pilot to build all the, the workflows. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then are you using Docker containers or Singularity for workflow execution? Uh, you no, we, uh, um, I, um, I didn't quite familiar with these tools. Actually, for I just build, uh, the workflow we, uh, is built based on pipeline palette component, and then uh, executed through the our high performance computing cluster. Okay, yeah, that's good. I guess in that sense, you may not need to um, worry about porting it out and around to very many different environments. Um, there was also a question. Uh, actually, to another member of the Merck team, and I wonder if now is an okay time to go ahead and discuss that. So um, this was by someone from Merck, Kira Armacost, who um, submitted a set of 18 ligands, so a, a partial submission um, for the set of ligands, but did very, very well across the set submitted. Um, extraordinarily well, and and I think actually she did very well in a couple where others failed. And so we were wondering if Kira could take a moment to comment about her methods. Um, um, yeah, I think he uh, she's online. Could you unmute her? I think okay. she probably could answer this question. Perfect. Thank you, Juan. I just unmuted her. Kira, are you there? Yes. Okay, great. Can you comment on that? Sure. So um, what I did is we have another submission of post predictions that was submitted um, by two of our modelers. And what I did is um, I took their best poses from either Glide or Gold that they um, had, and I submitted them to um, Domdeck, or it's not, excuse me, not Domdeck, um, uh, Desmond, sorry. Um, and so what I did is I, I just I put them all in solvent, I simulated them, or I minimized them, and then I simulated them for 25 nanoseconds. And at the end, I simply took the average structure at five nanosecond increments, and I compared that to one another and submitted the one that had the best pose um, relative to our docking performance. So really what I did is just essentially took the docking structures that we got out, ran them through dynamics, to get some of the protein to be able to move around this and let the ligand kind of fit itself in the in, in the pocket a little bit better, and then just submitted those to um, 
to, you know, the, the 18 that I got back to D3R. Okay. So it's pretty simple. Just post post processing of the of the docking study. Okay, thank you. Okay, that ends the questions that we have for um, Yuan and for Karen for Merck and Co. So thank you. The next set of or the next question is for Hervé um, at the NRC in Canada. I can ask this one. Oh yeah. Yeah, actually, Hervé, this is uh, Mike Gilson. This is a question I had, and it may be that I wasn't paying close enough attention. But you had that nice heat heat plot of. Um, yeah, the docking the ligands against the different coast crystal structures, and the heat was was the docking score. So, did you what was did you report like for each ligand the pose that gave the lowest energy across all of those protein structures, or was it based on a protein structure that was in some sense most relevant by some other metric? Okay, so for uh, the benzonidazoles, for example, I did I selected the best. Uh, pose overall across all the 26 uh, targets because they fell into benzenazole uh, targets uh, anyway. And the same was uh, applies to the score, yes. And the same for the isoxazoles uh, compounds, I could run them across all targets and they would have the best scores in the isoxazoles targets. So I did not have to make any selection of targets specific for those classes. Only for the sulfonamides and the uh, spirocycles, I had to select a target because there was not a perfect consensus of the binding modes for those for those classes only. But the other ones, the program was able to pick directly the proper uh, pocket, or the proper uh, 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 targets. So, would your recommendation would would you say that? I mean, so one way to pick your protein target is to find the target where the ligand is most similar in some way to the one you're trying to dock, but it, the other way would be to just say, just dock it into all the targets if you've got enough computer time and take the one that gives the best score. Do you think yes, that? Yes, that is the strategy we typically would use in a, in a virtual screen, for example, where we uh, have a, to, uh, multiple targets. This is, specific, this is the, the approach we generally take. Here, because we know they're all binders and they're all from a given class, of course, we are expecting that there is some consensus, and, and we, 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 we force that in the saponamide class. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's the only question we have uh, for you, Ervi. Thank you again. The next, the next set of questions are uh, for Christina and Zoe and team at the Cornea Lab. So, um, the first question is, how do you determine if two binding modes of a pose did not, in fact, interconvert? Uh, well, uh, okay, we just determined this by simply, uh, by visual inspection of the trajectories. We noticed that both uh, uh, the two different binding modes of a compound stay in their initial conformations but come out to about the same binding free energy and therefore uh, we corrected this compound's binding free energy with a formula uh, from the reference that I'm, I mentioned in my presentation. So the answer is by visual inspection of the trajectories. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you use the OPLS force field as opposed to the force field builder parameters in this um, FEP plus software. Was there any sort of rationale? Did you just not need to use the force field builder parameters, or I guess what was your rationale for changing it? Well, we just didn't have uh, a license for force field <laughs> yeah, builder. Unfortunately, we didn't have the license. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for OPLS, with OPLS 3. <laughs> yeah, but we'd like to ask the Merck group if uh, they had the force field builder and if they used that. Um, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can do that maybe when we get to the section uh, with uh, right, Christina. Perfect. Okay. Um, did you repeat runs to verify reproducibility of calculated binding free energies? So we did rerun two times the FEP calculation for the sulfonamides, and the results were reproducible. 
And uh, although it did not have the actual results from the Merck study, it looks like the RMSE and R square are similar. Yeah, we checked that also. They were pretty close. Oh, good. Um, okay, great. And then the last question. Okay, um, the last question is, uh, and I'm sorry, I haven't vetted this question particularly well, but the question is, are they planning to, are you planning to follow up work, or follow up work, to track down the accuracy problems that you discussed? Um, that, okay. Especially with, I guess, regard to treatment of the carboxylic acids, and it seems very important that people track this. Right, yeah, that was a, a problem, of course, and we definitely need to look into that for our own projects in order to see what we can do in order to you know move forward in this direction it's very challenging uh, to treat the carboxylic acids so yes we do have plans to look into that okay thank you okay great thanks guys we're going to move on to questions for Julian Michel at the University of Edinburgh Okay, so Julian, some folks are curious to find out to what extent you are amenable to sharing your workflows. And also whether your workflows are mostly implemented just in script format or are you using an automated workflow framework. Could you discuss that? Um, so it's mostly uh, in scripts at the moment. Um, and um, in principle, yes. Um, that is available in some form already, but probably not in an easy to download form yet. Uh, it's bits and pieces, and I use GitHub page. Um, so it would be useful. Yeah, we, we could make it available. But we haven't worked really hard to make it very easy to download and, and use. OK. Thank you. And then the second question is, in one slide you implemented a charged carboxylic acid group becoming a hydrogen, and how is this achieved? Uh, can you repeat that? How? I didn't get the question. The question was that, um, I guess in one part you implemented changing a carboxylic group to just becoming a hydrogen, and people, someone was wondering how that was achieved. They're probably wondering about the charge change, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, that nothing stops us from running this, but as I've shown in the presentation, we we get uh, um, very strange energetics, and uh, part of it is because of um, the reaction field cutoff we're using in our calculation. Uh, so we don't have yet a very good way of correcting uh, for finite size effect. So that's something we're working on at the moment. Um, so we did play a bit with uh, scaling down charges to try to come up with a workaround so we could do some submissions, uh, including charged species and neutral species as part of this rare ground challenge. Um, although it doesn't look like that that's a very useful method in the long term. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. That that ends your questions. Uh, the next question actually is for Christina Schindler from uh, Merck Darmstadt. Okay, so Christina, um, one question actually which came up in the discussion with Zoe and, and, Chris, and the other Christina <laughs> was um, which force field you use, whether you were using the standard OPLS3 or did you try the force field builder in Schrodinger's FFP Plus? I used the force field builder. Ah, that's interesting, okay. So yeah, that's interesting that that um, didn't affect the results so much. Yeah. And then a there's another question here, um, which is, the last question is, why are the results so, this is, I guess actually this is also for Zoe's group and Christina Athanasenu, so I can unmute her also. 
The question is, why are the results so similar between the, your two groups, and they were quite similar, if the Schindler free energies in the bound run looked poorly converged? Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I would really like to love to compare that in detail. <laughs> Yeah, so on our end, we didn't say that uh, the results were not converged. We also showed, I mean, we dedicated at least two minutes of our um, presentation to show that the results converged. So I don't know. Yes, I would like to com compare the results, especially on convergence. Okay, thank you. That was great. Thank you. Okay, and then the last set of questions we have are um, for Alex or Alexander Yakovenko. Okay, Alex, people had some questions about your methods. Um, sure. So, um, uh, I guess, uh, in, uh, are you using constant force or constant pulling, vo constant velocity pulling in your um, in your experiments? And then I guess, if so, how do you choose which velocity or which force you're using? Um, well, I'm choosing based on kind of experience, and um, so far the rate is um, kind of one uh, one nanometer per nanosecond uh, for for pulling part. And um, importance of pulling, I, I don't measure anything with pulling. I do all measurements with parallel umbrellas and then uh, time-dependent free energy. So for pulling, also the only requirement is to formulate a reasonable diversity of roots into the orthogonal dimensions of uh, orthogonal to reaction coordinate, I mean, uh, over energy landscape. and. Um, Usually, no very special efforts are required, just different starting seeds, slightly different starting confirmation, and system um, divorce very quickly. So, Alexander, this is uh, Mike here at DPR. Huh? So, hi, Mike. Hi. So, uh, if, the, um, if you didn't use the pulling to do the free energy calculations, then were you actually using the Jasinski inequality or, or really just using it to set up the pathways? Um, well, um, I'm considering umbrella sampling as quasi-equilibrium method, so, and, and using averages, like we see in, in, in um, Yarzinski pooling, averages idea, to apply them to quasi-equilibrium, because umbrella at the 32 nanosecond of sampling, which I'm using, which kind of doable with today hardware, it's still far away from being kind of uh, equilibrium measurement. That, that's that's all, all the idea. Is, is was the answer to your question? Um, maybe I might ask you some more later on. Thank you very much. Uh, sure, you're welcome. Uh, some more questions relate to how you selected the pulling vector reaction coordinates for each ligand. So, can you discuss oh. how you actually set that in practice? Well, it's it's a bit tricky because um, well. Um, you need to understand, again, it's kind of from experience, you need to more or less understand what is the most pro con of the most probable dissociation vector from your binding pose. And uh, say for um, competition, I have to use uh, my own crafted structure for free energy estimation because it have lowered energy uh, hills to my understanding, I did not, I can't measure it. It's kind of too intensive computational, but to my for my experience, so I have to craft my own structure and do a pulling there. And um, I did manually allocated a cone with center vector, most probably direction for dissociation. So to, the, the idea of of selecting this um, vector of dissociation is that roots that you draw along this vector should cover the most feasible low energy pathways. Yeah. So I did many leads. So you just you have your starting structure and then you're trying like a whole bunch of different pulling directions based on manual setting of the vector? Uh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I set 
have my structure, I set manually a vector and I did parallel poolings and parallel umbrellas and yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, and then a question, um, I think this is the last question, was, is, uh, the question is, is there a theoretical reason why it is valid to fit free energy versus sampling to a mono exponential? Um, well, it's, it's a semi-theoretical. I mean, um, you can consider uh, a pooling like a straight line on the energy surface. Now, when you invest more computational, the line become more and more curved, and the network become more and more self-organized along the um, channels, uh, low energy uh, passes on the energy surface. And you can think that amount of additions, uh, that amount of bands of your trajectory, when it's changed the direction in orthogonal coordinates depend on if it's run into hills or not. If it's run into hills, it's kind of energetical error, right? And if it's so if it's run into hills, it's tried to bend it. And this number are somehow uh, correlated. And the simplest way to do this is say that um, less the relation between amount of errors and amount of um, corrections are proportional, right? So you have like 10 errors and you have like k multiple by 10 need corrections. You apply every like every nanosecond of simulation. And then you just solve a differential equation, kind of simple. And uh, that's uh, the equation, how, how ways, ways goes. So it's kind of a solution of differential equation with assumption that amount of errors, second derivative, uh, amount of correction, second derivative is proportional to amount of errors, first derivative of what you see in time-dependent free energy. Okay. Uh, was this the answer? Okay, great. Okay, well with that, that concludes the Q&A for the first part of our webinar. Um, I guess I'd like to take, as we all here at DCR would like to take a moment just to thank all of the participants in the challenge, even those who weren't selected to speak, all the folks who've dialed in so far this morning and our speakers for a great set of talks.